the risk can come in from so many different places. This is why this is the DPIA is not something done by one person. It has to be a cross-functional effort. If that asset is used in your DPIA and you've got a system that's doing this centrally, then you immediately inherit all of those attributes. The relationship between the DPO or the privacy office and the security information security office is absolutely critical. Hello everyone, I'm Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and media around transparency and control, which is to say we're aiming for real customer centricity or, if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. We have Nick Basket here with us today. He's DPO at Holland and Barrett in London with a personal interest in ethics and philosophy, encryption and AI. In the past, he once published a book on DPIAs, on Data Protection Impact Assessments, and founded one of the early cybersecurity consultancies in the UK, MATA. With Nick, we have discussed best practices around data protection impact assessments or privacy impact assessments, depending on how you approach this or where you approach it from. Now, to get the boring stuff out of the way uh, and not, you know, not to ask him to read the law for us, uh, of course, we are referring to Article 35 in the GDPR where we see cases in which a DPIA is compulsory, should be done. On top of this, there are some guidelines from what now is the EDPB dating back to uh, 2017, to which we'll add a link. Let's get on with it. Nick, thanks for coming. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure. Um, so DPIAs and or in the US, I think we tend to call them instead of data protection impact assessment, privacy impact assessment. Uh, so, yeah. you know, what is this? Uh, how <laughs> would you define it? Well, I, I try and keep away. You know, there's a this complex um, terminology that we like to create for ourselves with PIAs and DPIAs. And uh, there actually is a difference. Um, but the DPIA came about, uh, I guess, after GDPR had introduced it. And it, it's, it's, it's a process that you carry out when you think that there may be a high risk to uh, the data subjects whose data you're processing. And you do it before you're engaging in that activity, right? So if you've got an activity you're planning to do and you think there's a potential high risk to those data subjects as a result of carrying out that activity, then you need to document your approach, what you're doing in quite some detail, uh, including doing a risk assessment and ensure that you're doing everything lawfully and correctly. And that if there are any high risks that you've mitigated or you've managed to control those high risks so that they're no longer high risks before you start the activity. And that's the DPIS is the document that just documents all of that activity. Very good, very good. And so there are some risks that are always very obvious. And in fact, as per even in, in the GDPR uh, Article 35, it already points in some direction. And in some areas, we can really see that we they're sort of compulsory, right? Uh, what is your what do you find the biggest risks? Well, it depends on it depends on the nature. So one of the first things that you look at uh, when you're doing the um, the uh, the DPIA is you look at the nature and context of the, of the data, right? And the processing activity. Now we actually called it an activity. Probably the first thing we should do is say, well, actually what's an activity? Like, because sometimes one of the first areas of confusion is people think you're, they kind of get it mixed up with like a vendor assessment or they're gonna be implementing a database. We're buying this database as an example, or a CRM system. We'll do a DPAA on that system. 
And typically that's not how it works. You're, you're actually trying to identify an activity. And what that means is you start at the beginning where you're collecting data, personal data from a data subject. And let's say it's from a data subject, it doesn't actually have to be, but let's say it's from a data subject. You're collecting that data from some source. And then it goes through a process where you're doing something to that data. And maybe in order to do something with that data, you're sharing it with third parties and you know, doing analysis. And nowadays you're running AI over it and you're doing whatever you know else. And at the end of it, there's some result, there's some purpose to this activity. And then it, hopefully at the end of the life cycle, you're then, you know, you're then removing or deleting that data. So there's this life cycle to it. And then you have to look in that activity as in a, in a holistic way. And that's what you're doing the assessment of. So, so you're starting off there. In terms of the risks, therefore, the risk can come in from so many different places. This is why this is the DPIA is not something done by one person. It has to be a cross-functional effort. And it means that you know, your risks, of course, uh, from cyber, um, you've got uh, security information risks. Is the information uh, secure? And sometimes it's not about the confidentiality. Sometimes it's about the integrity of the data, making sure that data is integral. You know, if you're uh, if you're Reuters, your you know your feed, your price feed changes every millisecond or whatever it is. The confidentiality is not an issue, but but if you can mess with the integrity of that data, it's 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 huge, right? So the risks come from so many different places. They can come from a lawful point of view where you've ab adopted the wrong lawful basis. It can come from, uh, it, it can come from uh, 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 third party risk where you're sharing the data with third parties and they might introduce risk into the process. So yeah, it's a multifaceted and, and uh, it's a multifaceted area where you need to look at it from many different angles. That's very good. So you do need a lot of people in the room at some point or sequentially, do you go and chase one after the other as you look at the life cycle? How do you work with that? Oh, that's really, how do you th think is the, the right approach? It's uh, almost like you prepared for this, Sergio, because that, <laughs> that's such a great question. You know, we, we, um, we tried lots of different methods. And one of the problems is like, depending upon where, so there's obviously there's the organizations that are mature and doing this, you know, the right way, they come to you at the beginning of a project and they say, you know, okay, we've got this project and you know, let's bring the people into the room. How do you want to play this? And then you can work it out. Then there's other ones where they come and they say, hey, great news, Nick, we signed off this contract. We're starting next week. Just need to get that DPA out the door, you know? We've and, done it already. We've done the <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything's ready to go. Just need to do the DPIA. Where do I sign? And, uh, and so, and so you kind of like, it all depends upon where you are in the process. So I, I, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with, with the term, you know, data, uh, data protection by design, DPPD. And one of the points of DPPD is that you think about this early on in the process, right? Because it's actually better for everybody that way. Everything goes so much smoother if you're thinking about things early on rather than leaving it to that last minute. But it also means that sometimes you don't have all the answers early on. You actually may not have chosen your vendors, right? So you might have a situation where you've got one vendor in the UK and another vendor in the US. So that changes an awful lot of, of things in terms of what you need to do and maybe who you need to involve. So it, you have to adopt and you have to adapt, I should say, to, to the scenario that you're facing. If, if they have all the answers, you can usually get people in the room, you know, in a reasonably parallel way. And the way that we structure it is we, we typically have sections. So we take all the questions that are relevant to a particular subject matter expert. So you've got all the security questions that go into a security section. And then you've got all of the subject matter expert questions that maybe go to the project leader, et cetera. And then, you know, you give them those questions either in one or two phases, depending on what they are in the project cycle, and then they get on with it. Okay, so uh, anything that you have learned in the past years in terms of formatting and, and documenting this, because we've had guidelines from different uh, DPAs, the ICO, I always find them very practical compared mm. with other DPAs. In, in, from my point of view, maybe not from yours, you know, having struggled with other guidelines, I think they're very practical. But I wonder what you think. How have... How has the format, the manner in which you compile all of this, how you document the measures that you propose, 
Has this evolved over time? Have you found some specific set of guidelines that you believe are more useful? How do you approach that, which is the actual format of, of the document itself? Yeah, if you're doing a lot of them, I strongly recommend you buy into a compliance solution system. If you're doing the ad hoc one or two or a few of them, then you know you can get the templates from the ICO. You don't have to pay for any system at all. And it's just an Excel spreadsheet. The benefits of doing it through a system is it it has got a built-in workflow. So you can do things like, you know, um, determine who the respondents are, who the approvers are, have that all in an audited trail, which is fantastic. Um, the thing I mentioned earlier about having sections uh, is also very useful um, within a compliance system because you can then assign sections to individuals and they can only see that section. That comes very useful when you're working with third parties because you don't want them, for example, to see the whole spreadsheet with all your security questions and you know points on there and risks and, and other things that you've identified. So the ability to parcel it up, um, control who accesses what, and then have a workflow system behind all of that that's all auditable, uh, inability to ask questions, put comments, raise issues, raise flags, et cetera, is very useful. In addition, what I would say, and this is, I, I guess part of the things that I've learned is that is that it's, again, if you're doing a lot of these sorts of things and you've got a complex environment, you've got um, processing activities happening, not just DPIAs, but a lot of threshold questions as well that, that, that don't ultimately go to a DPIA and other ways that you're capturing records and vendor assessments and you know assets with, with, with risks that you're controlling as well. Putting all that together into a central system allows you with the through the DPIA to bring in information where you've already got a lot of data. For example, so it saves you a lot of time. For example, if we've got an asset, uh, let's say it's a, a database, again, a favorite thing, databases. So if you've got a database that someone manages and you know that that asset is controlled and managed over here and it's got these security controls and it has these pen tests against it and maybe it has a couple of risks and whatever else, right? If that asset is used in your DPIA and you've got a system that's doing this centrally, then you immediately inherit all of those attributes and risks, et cetera, which is incredibly time saving and, and, and helpful. And of course, if you introduce new, more risks or if you're adding data categories into that database that went there previously, now potentially that has an impact that that a product owner, that database owner now needs to consider or it gets considered when they do the next pen test, et cetera. So it becomes, how dare I say, a virtuous circle or something that way. That would be one recommendation I'd have is if you're doing a lot of these things, consider the holistic way in which you're approaching compliance and security in the organization. Manage it along with your risk system. Make sure that you've got a risk system that works with your compliance, the way that you're going around your compliance and that you're sort of aligned in that way. And I very much then say, leading on to this, is, is, is say that the relationship between the DPO or the privacy office and the security, information security office is absolutely critical. Having that relationship absolutely rock solid is extremely important to make sure that you're aligned on things like the way that you capture risks and the way that you're measuring risk. Otherwise, you get some people measuring risk in one way, and then it goes into a central risk register, but it's other people are capturing risk measured a different way, and it becomes a mess. Very good points. True. So there's many angles here. So one of them, there's a uh... There's an advantage in terms of confidentiality as you develop as well new products. And for example, I'm thinking mobile apps or digital products where you've got all of these suppliers. You don't want to, them to see the final output or to understand everything. You do want to control risk in that specific example, <laughs> Apple, the, uh, these goggles. Ah. If we ever see them, you know, the vision. You're pro. getting a pair, aren't you? I'm not getting a pair. <laughs> <else>. But <laughs> but okay, but let's it's a good exercise. Can you imagine the DPIA for those? You've got all of these suppliers, right? And everything is built in secrecy. 
there's no way you can let them see what each other is doing. So you need to handle risk with them separate, which makes, and then it makes sense what you're saying. So you've got a system where someone is granted access just to that bit, and then they help you manage risk for that, but they will not understand how other sensors or, you know, or, or, or devices are working. And then at the same time, as you're saying, the fact that everything is modularized means that you can reuse and inherit that assessment, as you were saying with the database example. I really like that. So since you've got already a consistent way to approach this, and you're going to, you're going to be reusing some of these pieces as you keep developing products or services, it makes sense that only the new bits include incorporate new assessments, and then the whole or the, the project as a whole can be reviewed by someone that doesn't need to go into all of the details because all of them have already been audited by specific third parties or whoever can access them, if I've, if I've communicated that well. That's right. And you know what? If you have an incident, you should be able to go immediately to your system and say, what's the potential impact of that? And if you can't, then you've done it wrong. <laughs> So that's the litmus test at the end of it all. So, yeah. you know, if you have, God forbid, a, a data breach on your on your database, um, you should immediately go to be able to go there and say, you know, how 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 does it impact us? What data categories are involved? Uh, did we raise this as an issue previously that we haven't managed before? Uh, you know, all those sorts of things. You should have all those answers at your fingertips if you've done the system right. Very good. And then on, on collaborating with with. Uh security is super important because you cannot have two different definitions of of risk and that leads me into something else that these days is calling for a risk assessment as well which is of course ai it's like we can't <laughs> avoid it and uh, and everyone is now talking about this and we've got now a new dimension of risk assessments and their ai and potentially even a different supervisor as per the AI Act, there's a new supervisor and, and DPAs are complaining, at least in Spain, that they need to be in sync somehow because they, I'm look at look at the French, uh, the GNIL is already taking the AI responsibilities, right? And issuing guidelines and yeah. so on, and also ICO. So how do you see that? Uh, are you, do you see yourself working with a separate team and then having to add that? Or are you taking on taking that, that, that job on board, if I can ask you that. I'm taking the job on board and uh, I'm very excited about it, but uh, you're absolutely right. It's, I mean, let's just call it what it is. It's a mess at the moment, but you know, of course it's a mess because everything's happened so quickly. You know how, I actually think that the EU has responded very, very quickly and well to it. Um, I'm still, you know, rereading the third time the ICOs, or not the ICOs, sorry, the government's uh, response to how they do things. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of vagaries in there. It sounds good. And then you read it again. They say things like, um, we're going to take an agile and iterative approach, I think was one of the terms in there. You're like, so that means you, that's a euphemism for we've got no idea. We're just going to keep making <laughs> this up as we improvise. go along. You know, you're, you're going to improvise, right? <laughs> um, but so the, the couple of points to make are, are, first of all, on the risk assessment side, everyone gets, not everyone, it's a very common thing when people are starting out on this to, to look at business risk. And and this is the issue. One of the issues is that as a DPO, I, 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 I'm not there to care about the business risk. I'm there to care about the risk to the data subjects. Now, at some point, because this goes onto a central risk register, that has to be translated into the business risk, right? So if we're, let's take an example, if we're unable to meet a particular data subject right, we, we built a system and, oh, oops, we forgot to, you know, have the ability to, I don't know, do something with it. That, that, so we can't, we can't give the information to the users or we can't support their right to object or whatever it might be. And that's an issue for me, but what's the issue to the business of that? Then you have to translate that. And, well, that could be, that could mean, you know, we get fined or whatever it might be. So when we talk about AI and, and risk assessments in, in, in general, um, I guess the risks are compliance risks and security risks. So there's two. Uh, everybody, of course, is jumping on the bandwagon and throwing data to, to open AI. Uh, it's not my, not my first choice. If you've ever read their terms of service, um, I sort of waved that terms of service around at the legal department uh, a few times um, here. And, the, and you know, it says that you indemnify them. That's the bottom line. 
And so anything, anything from a commercial point of view, and this is slightly outside my wheelhouse, but from a commercial point of view, if you're using anything that, that somebody could potentially sue you for because it's a derivative, derivative work or whatever the, the, the terminology is, um, they can go to OpenAI, sue you OpenAI, and OpenAI can come back and just claim the money back from you. That would be a concern to me if I was in the legal team uh, operating that. From a personal data point of view, of course, um, we should not be sending personal data to these third parties. That's my point of view right now. I don't think we're ready for it. We should not be sending personal data, period. There is not a safe way to do it. Uh, but there are, I mean, everybody right now associates a bit as sort of open AI and chat GPT has kind of become a, a noun now, hasn't it, you know, for for AI systems. But there's lots of others out there and there's models out there that are that are coming, you know, and I love the stuff that Langchain's doing. I love the stuff that Hug and Face is doing. And these, you know, th there are models. And actually also, frankly, the big companies like Microsoft and also Google are developing corporate models where, you know, they, they, your data can be ring fenced and owned by you. And I think rather than rushing to, to do what's quick right now and easy, we should be thinking a little bit harder about what our corporate approach should be, where our boundaries are. I think in the US they called them guardrails. Um, so they want to have guardrails. And I think we should have guardrails saying, these are things that you just don't do. If you want to do X, then, you know, without specifying the technology, we have to say that X means that, that these safety protocols have to be in place. Okay, Nick. So anything else that you would add? Um, I think this, this thing, DPIAs have evolved so much. You know, I remember in, in 20, I think it was 2016 or 2017, the CNIL in France released this software for for DPAs, so you can install it. It was really clunky. I, I tried a few times. It was <laughs> I, I, I but failed. I tried. Yeah, but I tried. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, it was something you would download to your computer. I think it had to be for a PC. I can't remember. And it would just in the end, once you install it, I believe it was just about populating forms, and then it would spit out a document, something pretty basic. But they've been this thing has evolved, and then you're talking about systems where, yeah, we can already reuse modules and how, you know, privacy program management um, tools have evolved. Is there anything, any tips that you would add uh, to this? Yes. For DPOs that are struggling or don't know how to start, you know, any oh, tips? Oh, okay. Tips for starting. Um, I mean, get... get get the practice in <laughs> there's nothing there's no substitution for for experience in, in this case uh if you can if you can go and meet up i mean I, we hold i try and hold meetings you know every couple of months in london so if you're sort of london based you know definitely reach out to me because a, a group of us get together and we talk about stuff we just get together we don't you know, have a coffee and a biscuit and you know chat about different things that we're challenges that we're doing but do local meetups because i think talking to other people um is an is a nice way to get the experience without getting the experience if that makes sense uh but the the i would say there isn't a one size fits all it's different for different organizations if you're processing a lot of special category data you're going to have a different approach and a different risk appetite i hope to to this than you know if you're manufacturing pencils or something and and so there will be an appropriate thing for each for each company and if you go too heavy when it's inappropriate the business won't love you and the business doesn't love you they won't do it they won't care and you'll just be you know a pencil pusher and then they won't think about it seriously and then that that has negative consequences uh, there so you want to try to make something that is appropriate build a system that is appropriate for the kinds of data that you're processing the kind of activities that you're doing um, and get the business on side to what you're doing that that's that's sort of winning the, the the winning the hearts and minds it's a tough that's a tough order because let's be honest <clears throat> this is not what people wake up in the morning and say wow i've got that dpia from compliance to do today it's going to be a how great exciting. day how exciting you know so you kind of got to win them over with with um you know with, with, by, by getting them to, you know, to get them to buy into the fact that this is part of being a professional these days um, it's not about well, if you don't do this, you know the potential risks are and that fear, uncertainty, and doubt message. But I would say put a, put a fair amount of effort into building some relationships with people, get them to understand that this is now 
the, 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 the world order. This is how we do things because bad things do happen on a regular basis. We see them. We don't want to be one of those people. Let's be professionals. Uh, that would be one of the things I would say. Very good. Any final thoughts or readings or, or tips or any, any ideas? Any last I think, thoughts? yeah, I, I think one of the greatest challenges we're going to have going forward, and this is, this is if, a little bit when you're above just doing the basics, but one of the greatest challenges is, is what we call purpose, purpose uh, limitation and, and, and purpose compatibility. One of your challenges as a DPO is going to be how do you stop the business from using that data for other stuff that they're not supposed yeah. to. And yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not malicious. It's just like, you know, they've got the data. Hey, we've got all that data. Let's go and do this. You know what we can do? We can build profiles now and do some stuff with AI. And you won't even know that this is going on. So you've got to be a little bit proactive in, in helping the business understand that you've collected information under some lawful basis for a specific purpose. And you need to have then the policies in place internally that are accepted and understood by all the departments that say, if you're going to go and grab data from somewhere to use it, that there needs to be so a little check there to say, is that compatible with the original reason that we gave the data subject when we collected their data? And that, that's a challenge, I think, for a lot of organizations. So that's a good point. And it's true, you need, if you have a system of record, then at least, you know, okay, that data set is already present. I can already see what was the original retention period or what was the legal basis. But you're right, that happens all the time. Oh, I need to train this algorithm. You know, I've got this foundation model now that we're talking about this. <laughs> back uh, to AI again. Give me some data. <laughs> yeah, back to AI. Exactly. Give me this data. Yeah. Okay. Well, Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.